the General Motors Hour. General Motors Holdens, through the Macquarie Network and cooperating stations in all states, present The Winslow Boy, starring Robert Stewart. This is John Deese introducing our play. Recent events in Scotland and the British House of Commons, where the subject of doing justice to a Scottish boy who made accusations against the police became front page news, make The Winslow Boy a very timely play. This famous piece by Terence Rattigan is founded on another similar case which occurred some 50 years ago and makes the sort of strong drama which has made it a resounding success whenever and wherever it has been performed. Our General Motors R cast is headed by Robert Stewart as Arthur Winslow, with Diana Perryman, Ray Hartley, Winifred Green, Keith Buckley, Nellie Lamport, Don Pascoe, Derek Barnes and Leonard Bullen. The play will be produced by Harry Harper. Ladies and gentlemen, Act One of the General Motors R production of The Winslow Boy. Master Ronnie! Why, we weren't expecting you back from the Naval College till Tuesday. Uh, hello, Violet. I, I came back early. On Sunday? My, your mother and father will be surprised. Uh, where are they? Oh, church, of course. Mmm, you do look nice in your uniform. Quite a little officer. Now, won't your parents and Master Dicky and Miss Catherine be surprised? I'd better go and get your room ready for you. I think I'll go out into the garden for a bit. I'll come in when they get back. Is anything wrong, Master Ronnie? No. No, I'll, I'll just wait in the garden. <sighs> Glad to get home. My leg's not very good, Grace. Sit down, Arthur, dear. Catherine, close the garden door. Very well, Mother. There is rather a draught. What a dreary sermon. Old Jackson's getting quite doddery. Doddery though he may be, Dicky. I doubt if he failed in his past mods when he was at Oxford. Father, you promised not to mention that again this vacation if I promised to do some study every night. Dicky, dear, you really couldn't have done much work last night with that old gramophone of yours blaring. I wish you were as good at your work as Ronnie, dear. Oh, why no, why no. He got into husband and I failed. That's going to be brought up again. Ronnie's the good little boy, I'm the bad little boy. You've stuck a couple of labels on us that nothing on earth is ever going to change. Oh, don't be absurd, Dickie, dear. It's not absurd, it's quite true. Isn't it, Katie? If I were you, I'd go and have a nice little lie down before lunch. Uh, perhaps you're right. But it's true, just the same. What are you reading, Catherine? Lou Rogers' book, Memoirs of a Trades Union, Leader. Oh, dear. Does John know you're a radical and a suffragette? Certainly. And he still wants to marry you? He seems to. He's coming early today to speak to Father. And, Father, dear, I warn you, if you forbid the match, I shall simply elope. No, oh, <laughs> never fear, my dear. I'm far too delighted at the prospect of getting you off our hands at last. <laughs> Though I must say, you don't behave as if you were in love. I don't think you modern girls have the feelings our generation did. It's this new woman attitude. Kate, darling, does Desmond know about you and John? I haven't told him, but if he hasn't guessed, he must be very dense. He is very dense. I think he's a dear. Well, that'll be John now. Quickly, Kate, come into the dining room. All right, Mother. Well, what on earth are you running away for? We're leaving you alone with John. When you're finished, cough, and then we'll come in. Mightn't that look a trifle coincidental? Mr. Wotherstone. <clears throat> Morning, sir. Ah, John. And forgive me not getting up. My arthritis has been troubling me lately. Sit down, won't you? Thank you, sir. I, um, I understand you want to marry my daughter. Uh, yes, sir. I proposed to her, and she's done me the honour of accepting. I, I love her very much, sir. Yes, well, we'll take the sentimental side of the project for granted. As regards the more practical aspect, um, uh, your income, you're able to live on it? Uh, no, sir. I'm in the regular army. But my army pay is supplemented by my father. 
It adds up to a total of about £420 a year, sir. Well, well, it all seems very satisfactory. I really don't think I need to delay my congratulations any longer. Thank you, sir. And your frank answers to my questions deserve uh, an equal frankness from me about Catherine's own affairs. I'm afraid she's not a... Just in case you thought otherwise, I'm afraid she's not the daughter of a rich man. I didn't think otherwise, sir. Good. The Westminster Bank pay me a small pension, and my wife has about 200 a year of her own. So you see, I'm not in a position to be very lavish about Catherine's dowry. Uh, no, sir, I quite see that. However, I propose to settle on her one-sixth of my total capital. In round figures, say, 850 pounds. I call that very generous, sir. Ah, well then, if you're agreed, I don't think there's anything more we need to discuss. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Um, it's pretty rotten weather, eh? Beastly rain. Uh, yes, sir. Why, John, you're here. How nice. Catherine, here's John. Hello, John. Hello, Catherine. Well? Well, what? How did your little talk go? I understood you weren't supposed to know we were having a little talk. Oh, you're infuriating. Is it all right, John? Yes, Mrs. Windsor. Oh, I'm so glad. I really am. May I kiss you? After all, I'm practically your mother now. Well, I, by the same token, am practically your father, but if you'll forgive me... Oh, certainly, uh, sir. Yes. Uh, Grace, I think we might allow ourselves a modest celebration. Uh, will you come with me and find the key of the cellar? Yes, dear, coming. Uh, I don't suppose you two will mind being left alone for a few moments, will you? John, darling, was it an ordeal? Oof, I was scared to death. Uh, are you as scared of him as I am? Dickie is, of course, and Ronnie, though he needn't be. Father worships him. I don't know about Mother being scared. Sometimes, perhaps. I'm not. Ever. Uh, you're not scared of anything, are you, Kate? <laughs> Kate! Kate! Ronnie! What on earth? Come in out of the rain. Where's Father? I'll go and tell him. Oh, no, don't. Please, Kate, don't. What's the trouble, darling? You can tell me. Uh, look, uh, perhaps I'd better disappear. In the dining room there, if you don't mind, John. Uh, no, no, of course not. Now, darling, tell me. Have you run away? This letter. It's addressed to Father. Ronnie, did you open it? Read it. Good heavens. I didn't do it. Kate, really, I didn't. No, no. Couldn't we tear it up? We could tell Father term it ended two days sooner. Ronnie, old lad. You back already? No trouble, is there? Um, yes, Dickie. You stay here with him. I'll go and find Mother. All right. What's up, old chap? Been sacked? Yes. I didn't do it. Honestly, I didn't, Dickie. That's all right, old chap. I believe you, though I don't know what it is they've sacked you for yet. Stealing. Ha! Huh. Is that all? Good Lord, at school we used to pinch everything we could lay our hands on. All of us. Here's Mother now, darling. Ronnie. Ronnie, my baby. I didn't do it, Mother. No, darling, of course you didn't. We'll go upstairs and get you out of those nasty wet clothes. Don't tell Father. No, darling, not yet, I promise. Come along now. Your new uniform, too. What a shame. I say, Kate, who's going to break the news to the old man? Don't let's worry about that just now. Well, count me out. I'm going to disappear. I don't want to be within a thousand miles of that explosion. John! What is it? Bad news, darling. Oh, John, how can people be so cruel to torture a child of that age? What's he supposed to have done? Stolen some money ten days ago. Why didn't they let us know? Think what that poor little creature's been going through these last ten days alone down there, knowing what he had to face at the end of it. Oh, how I'd love to have that commanding officer here for just two minutes. How will your father take it? It might kill him. Oh, heavens, that'll be Desmond. I'd forgotten he was coming to lunch, too. Who? Desmond Curry, our family solicitor. Darling, be nice to him. He doesn't know about us yet, and he's been in love with me for years. It's a family joke. Mr. Curry. Hello, Desmond. I don't think you know John Motherstone. No, I've heard a lot about him. How do you do? How do you do? I, I hear I'm to congratulate you both. Desmond, you know. Violet told me just now in the hall. Of course, it was expected, I know. Still, it was rather a surprise hearing it like that. 
I'm sure you'll be very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Desmond, dear. Hello, Mrs. Winslow. I've got him to bed, Katie. Uh, nobody ill, I hope. No, no, nothing wrong at all. Grace, those sellers are in a shocking condition. Oh, hello, Desmond. How are you? Not looking well. I strained my shoulder, Mr. Winslow. You will play those ridiculous games. Resign yourself to the onrush of middle age. Oh, I, I could never give up cricket. Not altogether. Are you related to DWH? I am DWH Curry. Didn't you know we had a great man in the room? Good Lord. You used to be a schoolboy hero of mine. D.W.H. Curry in person. Gosh, I'd never have thought of it. I know. Very few people would nowadays. Now, where is Violet with that tray of drinks? Um, drinking a toast to the, uh, to the, uh, a Happy pair, I think, is the phrase that's alluding you, Desmond. Uh, matter of fact, I was looking for something new to say. Oh, that's a forlorn quest, my dear Desmond. No one, with the possible exception of Voltaire, could find anything new to say about an engaged couple. Engaged couple? Oh! Is that all spliced up now? Kate definitely being entered for the marriage stakes. Oh, good egg. I should have added, with the possible exception of Voltaire and Dickie Winslow. Ah, here's Violet with the drinks. Ah, that's right, Violet, one for each of us. Oh, and we mustn't leave you out of the toast. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Your surprise would be more convincing, Violet, if you hadn't brought that extra glass for yourself. Oh, I brought that one for Master Ronnie, sir. For Master Ronnie, Violet? I thought you might allow him just a sip for the toast, sir. He's that grown up these days. Master Ronnie won't be back from Osmond till Tuesday. Oops, he's back already, sir. Came this morning, all by himself. Grace, what does this mean? All right, Violet, you can go. Yes, miss. Oh, I do hope I haven't... Uh, have... uh, yes, miss. You all knew Ronnie was back? We... we thought it best you shouldn't know. Only for the time being, Arthur. Well, will someone tell me what has happened, please? He brought this letter for you, Arthur. Read it to me. Arthur, not in front Read it to me, please. Confidential. I am commanded by my Lord's Commissioners of the Admiralty to inform you that they have received a communication from the commanding officer of the Royal Naval College at Osborne, reporting the theft of a five-shilling postal order at the college on the seventh instant which was afterwards cashed at the post office. Investigation of the circumstances of the case leaves no other conclusion than that the postal order was taken by your son, Cadet Ronald Arthur Winslow. My lords deeply regret that they must therefore request you to withdraw your son from the college. It's signed by someone. I can't quite read the name. Catherine? Will you ask Ronnie to come here and see me, please? Yes, Father, very well. And perhaps the rest of you will go into luncheon. Arthur, don't you think... Will you go in, Desmond? And John? Um, uh, this way. It's uh, getting cold. I right, certainly. Arthur. Yes, Grace. Please don't... Don't forget he's only a child. Deeply regret request you to withdraw your son. Father? Come in. Come over here. Why aren't you in your uniform? It got wet. How did it get wet? I was out in the garden in the rain. Why? I was hiding. From me? Are you so frightened of me? This letter says you stole a postal order. I... Now, I don't want you to say a word until you hear what I've got to say. If you did it, you must tell me. I shan't be angry with you, Ronnie, provided you tell me the truth. But if you tell me a lie, I shall know it, because a lie between you and me can't be hidden. I shall know it, Ronnie, so remember that before you speak. Did you steal the postal order? No, Father, I didn't. Go on back to bed, son. Yes, Father. Oh, and in future, I trust that a son of mine will at least show enough sense to come in out of the rain. Yes, Father. Hello? You there? I want to 
put a trunk call through, please? A trunk call, yes. The Royal Naval College, Osborne. And listen, Dickie, another letter to the editor in the Evening Star. What's it say, Katie? Sir, I agree that it is scandalous that the efforts of Mr. Arthur Winslow to secure a fair trial for his son over the past nine months have been thwarted at every turn by a soulless oligarchy. Soulless oligarchy? Well, that's rather good. It is high time that the private and peaceful citizens of this country awoke to the increasing encroachment of their ancient freedom by the new despotism of Whitehall. And here's another from Perplexed. Mm. Go ahead. Surely we have more important matters to get worked up about than a 14-year-old boy and a five-shilling postal order. The Admiralty might be forgiven if it stated that it had rather more urgent affairs to deal with than Master Ronald Winslow's little troubles. A further inquiry before the Judge Advocate of the Fleet has now fully confirmed the original findings that the boy was guilty. I sincerely trust that this will finally end this ridiculous and sordid little storm in a teacup. It sounds awful, Katie, but if he hadn't been my own brother, I think I might have seen his point. Oh, well. I say, uh, are you going out with John tonight? Yes, I suppose so. Well, nothing wrong, is there? Not going to be left at the altar rails or anything, are you? Not as bad as that, Dickie. Just an occasional difference of opinion. Take a spot of advice. Suppress your opinions. Men don't like them in their lady friends, even if they agree with them. And if they don't, it's fatal. You're studying hard, I see, Dickie. Oh, it was my fault, Father. I enticed him from his work to talk. Oh, well, I'm not surprised you succeeded. What did the doctor say, Father? He said, if I remember his exact words, that we weren't quite as well as when we last saw each other. That information seems expensive at the guinea. Oh, yes, by the way... I'm expecting Sir Robert Morton at any moment. Sir Robert Morton? Oh, goodness, I must go and do something about my hair. Dickie, what do you suppose one of your bookmaker friends would lay as odds against your getting your degree? Well, um, perhaps seven to four against? Well, you're not thinking of having a bet, are you? No, Dickie, I'm not a gambler. That's exactly the trouble. And happily, I'm no longer in a position to gamble 200 pounds a year on what you yourself admit is an outside chance. You... you want me to leave Oxford? It's the case, I suppose. Yes. It's costing me a lot of money. I'm afraid this is rather a shock for you. I'm sorry. Oh, no. No, it isn't really. I, I've been rather expecting it, as a matter of fact. Especially since I've heard you're hoping to brief Sir Robert Morton. Still, I can't say but what it isn't a bit of a slap in the face. Hello? Yes, this is he. Oh, the Daily News. Just hold the line a moment, will you? Oh, it's all right, Father. I'll go upstairs and see you later. Oh, Dickie. Yeah, I must thank you, Dickie, for bearing what must have been a very unpleasant blow with some fortitude. All right, Father. Uh, hello, are you still there? Sir Robert Morton. Yes, it is true. I'm hoping he will take the case. I understand he's the best advocate in the country. He's certainly the most expensive. Well, certainly I'm continuing the case, no matter what happens. You may recall that when my solicitors first took the matter up with the Admiralty and demanded a full inquiry, we were ignored for weeks and then given a blank refusal. It was only after tremendous pressure was brought to bear that the Admiralty agreed to what they call an independent inquiry. But at that inquiry, my son, a child of 14, was not represented by counsel, solicitors, or friends. Inevitably, he was found guilty again, and thus branded a second time before the world as a thief and a forger. And you ask, am I still going on with the case? I shall continue to fight this monstrous injustice with every weapon and every means at my disposal. Not at all. Good day. Am I still going on? Oh! Are you talking to yourself, Arthur, dear? Oh. Grace, I didn't hear you come in. Yes, Ronnie, dear. He's just arrived. Hello, Father. Mr. Moore says I'm to tell you I needn't go back to school until Monday, if you like. So that gives me three whole days. Oh, I've had your half-term report, Ronnie. Have you? Oh, on the whole, it was pretty fair. Good. Well, you'd better go upstairs and get washed. So 
Sir Robert will be here in a few minutes. All right, Father. Oh, I say, do you know how long the train took? 123 miles in two hours and 52 minutes. Ooh, that is traveling. Oh, Violet! Violet! I'm back! Where are you, Violet? Violet! Did the doctor say anything, dear? Mm, a great deal. Very little to the purpose. Violet says he left an ointment to massage yeah, your back. All the good that'll do. I now, imagine. Arthur, dear, it's silly to spend all this money on doctors if you're not even going to do what they say. Oh, all right, Grace, all right, all right. Ronnie's back, judging by the noise. Yes, dear. I must go and see that he washes properly behind his ears. Oh, Kate, Kate. Are we both mad, you and I? What's the matter, Father? <laughs> I don't know. I suddenly feel suicidally inclined. The press has been on to me again. Even they think we are crazy to go on. Shall we drop the whole thing, Kate? I don't consider that a serious question, Father. You realize that if we do go on, your marriage settlement must go? Oh, yes. I gave that up for last weeks ago. And will it... Will it make any difference to you and John? Good heavens, no. <laughs> then let us pin our faith to Sir Robert Morton and hope that he will accept the brief. You can pin your faith to him, Father. You know how I feel about him. But everybody says he's the best man. Oh, very fine. If one happens to be a large monopoly attacking a trade union or, or a Tory paper libeling a labor leader. But it utterly defeats me how you or anyone else could expect a man of his record to have a, have a tenth of his heart in a case where the boot is entirely on the other foot. Kate, you're my only ally. Without you, I believe I should have given up long ago. Still, you must sometimes allow me to make my own decisions. I have an instinct about Morton. Arthur, if you'll come upstairs, I'll massage your back. Infernal doctors and their orders. Coming, Grace, coming. You see which is right, eh, Kate? My instinct or your reason? I'm afraid we will. And now, Act Two of The General Motors, our production of The Winslow Boy. Sir Robert Morton and Mr. Curry. Oh, why, Sir Robert, I'm Catherine Winslow. Won't you sit down? My father won't be long. Thank you. I'm afraid Sir Robert can only spare us a very few minutes of his valuable time this evening. It's very good of him to come at all, if I may say so. I know. I can assure you we're very conscious of it. Uh, yes. Uh, perhaps I'd better advise your father of our presence. Yes, do, Desmond. You'll find him having his back rubbed. I see. In his bedroom, I presume. I suppose you know the history of this case, Sir Robert. I believe I've seen most of the relevant documents. I'm surprised that a case of this sort should interest you. Are you? It sounds such a trivial affair compared to most of your great forensic triumphs. I was in court during your cross-examination of Lou Rogers in the trades union embezzlement case. Really? It was masterly. Thank you. I suppose you heard that he committed suicide a few months ago. Yes, I had heard. Many people believed him innocent, you know. Yes, I understand. As it happens, however, he was guilty. Sir Robert, I am Arthur Winslow. This is my wife. How do you do? How do you do? I understand from Mr. Curry that you're rather pressed for time. Sir Robert is dining at Devonshire House. Oh, I see. Well, my son shall be down in a moment. I expect you will wish to examine him. Just a few questions. I fear that's all I'll have time for this evening. I'm sorry to hear that. He's made the journey from school especially. Perhaps a fuller examination tomorrow might be arranged. Tomorrow is impossible. I'm in court all the morning and in the House of Commons for the rest of the day. If a further examination should prove necessary, it will have to be some time next week. I see. Um, Curry says you think it might be possible to proceed by petition of right. What's a petition of right? A subject can sue the Crown by petition of right, redress being granted as a matter of grace, and the customers for the Attorney General are on behalf of the King to endorse the petition and allow the case to come into court. It's interesting to note that the exact words he uses on such occasions are, let right be done. Uh, Father. Ah, this is my son, Ronald. Ronnie, this is Sir Robert Morton. How do you do, sir? He's going to ask you a few questions. You must answer them all truthfully, as you always have. I expect you'd like us to leave, Sir Robert. No, provided, of course, that you don't interrupt. Now, Ronald, I'd like you to cast your mind back to July the 7th of last year. Will you tell me, in your own words, exactly what happened on that day? Well, it was a half-holiday, so we didn't have any work after dinner. 
And just before dinner, I went to the chief petty officer and asked him to let me have 15 and 6 out of what I had in the school bank. Why did you do that? I wanted to buy an air pistol. Which cost 15 and 6? Yes, sir. After you'd withdrawn the 15 and 6, what did you do? I had dinner and then went to the locker room and put the 15 and 6 in my locker. Yes, then? I went to get permission to go down to the post office. Then I went to the locker room again, got out my money and went down to the post office. I see. Go on. I bought my postal order. For 15 and 6? Yes. And then I went back to the college. Then I met Elliot Minor and he said, I say, isn't it rot? Someone's broken into my locker and pinched a postal order. I've reported it to the P.O. Those were Elliot Minor's exact words? He might have used another word for rot. I see. Continue. Well then, just before prep, I was told to go along to see Commander Flower. The woman from the post office was there and the commander said, Is this the boy? And she said, It might be. I can't be sure. They all look so much alike. You see, she couldn't identify him. Please. Go on. Then she said, I only know that the boy who bought the postal order for 15 and 6 was the same boy that cashed the five shillings. So the commander said, did you buy a postal order for 15 and 6? And I said yes. Then they made me write Elliot Miner's name on an envelope and compared it to the signature on the postal order. Then they sent me to the sanatorium and ten days later I was sacked. I mean, expelled. I see. Did you cash a postal order belonging to Elliot Miner for five shillings? No, sir. Did you break into his locker and steal it? No, sir. When the commander asked you to write Elliot's name, how did you write it? Christian name or initials? I wrote Charles K. Elliot. What made you choose that particular form? That was the way he usually signed his name. How did you know? I, I'd seen him sign things. Did he know you saw him? Well, yes. In other words, he showed you how he wrote his signature? Yes, I suppose he did. Did you practice writing it yourself? I might have done. What do you mean, you might have done? Did you or did you not? Yes. Ronnie, you didn't You practiced that... forging Elliot's signature. It wasn't forging. What did you call it then? Writing. Very well. Writing. Whoever stole the postal order and cashed it also wrote Elliot's signature, didn't he? Yes. And oddly enough, in the exact form in which you earlier had been practicing writing his signature. I say, which side are you on? Don't be impertinent. Are you aware that the greatest handwriting expert in England has stated that the signature on the postal note and the one on the envelope were by one and the same hand? Yes. And you still say you didn't forge that signature? Yes, I do. When you went to the locker room after dinner, were you alone? Yes, of course. The money would have been perfectly safe in your pocket. Why did you suddenly feel yourself impelled to put it away in your locker? I don't know. Was it because you knew you'd be alone in the locker room at the time? No. What time did Elliot put his postal order in his locker? I don't know. I didn't even know he had a postal order at all. He didn't tell me about it. How long were you in the locker room? About five minutes. What did you do then, before you went to the post office? I, I don't remember. It's odd that your memory is so good about some things and so bad about others. You were still in the locker room, rifling Elliot's locker, weren't you? Sir Robert, I must ask Quiet. you Quiet! I remember now, I was talking to a chap named Casey. What did you say to him? I said, come down to the post office with me, I'm going to cash a postal order. Cash a postal order? I, I mean get. You said cash. Why did you say cash if you meant get? I, I don't know. I suggest cash was the truth. No, no, no it wasn't. You're, you're muddling me. You seem easily muddled. How many other lies have you told? None. None really I haven't. I suggest your whole testimony is a lie. No, it's the truth. I suggest there's barely one single word of truth in anything you've said. I suggest that you broke into Elliot's locker, that you stole the postal order for five shillings belonging to Elliot, and that you cashed it by means of forging his name. I didn't! I didn't! I suggest you did it for a joke, meaning to give Elliot the five shillings back, but that when you met him and he said he'd reported the matter, you got frightened and decided to keep quiet. No, 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 it isn't true! 
I suggest that by continuing to deny your guilt, you're causing great hardship to your own family and considerable annoyance to high and important persons in this country. That's a disgraceful thing to say. I agree. I suggest that the time has come for you to undo some of the misery you've caused by confessing to us all now that you're a forger, a liar, and a thief. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not! I didn't do it! I Charlie, of course you did. This is outrageous! How dare you say that? 7.30. I must be going. Can I drop you somewhere, Mr. Curry? My car's at the door. Uh, no, I, I thank you. Well, send all this stuff around to my chambers tomorrow morning, will you? But will you need it now? Oh, yes. The boy is plainly innocent. I accept the brief. That Ronald Winslow is a servant of the Crown, and has therefore no more right than any other member of His Majesty's forces to sue the Crown in open court. To allow him to do so would undoubtedly would undoubtedly raise the precedent. In certain cases, private rights have to be sacrificed for the public good. Ronnie, I trust my reading to you isn't keeping you awake. Oh, really, Grace? My poor, sleepy little lamb. It's long past his bedtime, Arthur. I'd better take him upstairs. No. At this moment, your poor, sleepy little lamb is the subject of a very violent and heated debate in the House of Commons. Until it's ended, the cause of it all will not make himself comfortable in his little bed. Grace, did you speak to Violet today? I'll do it sometime, Arthur. Well, delaying it only adds to your worries. You explain the dilemma carefully, show her the figures I jotted down for you. I don't think you'll find her unreasonable. It won't be easy for her to find another place. Will you give her excellent references? I don't care what references she gets or how many figures she's shown. It's a brutal thing to do. Mm, facts are brutal things. Facts? I don't think I know what facts are anymore. Mm, facts at this moment are that we, we have half the income we had a year ago and we're living at the same rate. I brought you some sandwiches, sir. Oh, is Master Ronnie asleep? Yes. There was a bit in the evening news. Did you read it, sir? No. What did it say? Oh, how it was a fuss about nothing and a shocking waste of the government's time, but how it was a good thing all the same because it could only happen in England. Uh, will that be all, sir? Yes, Violet, that will be all. Very well, sir. Oh, good evening, miss. Good evening, Violet. Hello, Father. I'm back from the house already. Is the debate over? As good as. It'll end exactly where it started. They still refuse us a trial. Didn't Sir Robert make any protest? Not a verbal protest. Something far more spectacular and dramatic. Hmm? He'd had his feet on the treasury table and his hat over his eyes during most of the First Lord's speech, and he suddenly got up very deliberately, glared at the First Lord, threw a whole bundle of notes on the floor and stalked out of the house. It made a magnificent effect. If I hadn't known, I could have sworn he was genuinely indignant. Well, of course he was. Any man of feeling would be. Sir Robert, Father dear, is not a man of feeling. Don't fool yourself about him. He's a fish. A hard, cold-blooded, supercilious, sneering fish, is Sir Robert Morton. Sir Robert Morton. Oh. oh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I thought I'd call and give you an account of the day's proceedings. But I see your daughter's forestalled me. Ah, the casus belli is dormant, I see. I'll wake him. Ronnie. Oh, no, no. Please don't disturb his innocent slumbers. Innocent slumbers? Exactly. Uh, my daughter told me of your demonstration during the First Lord's speech. She described it as magnificent. Did she? Well, it's a very old trick, you know. I nearly always find it surprisingly effective. You mean you... Oh, Catherine, this letter on the table, when did it come? This afternoon. I know the writing. I shouldn't bother to read it if I were you. It may be important. Will you forgive me, Sir Robert? Of course. Good heavens. Not bad news, I hope. Um, Father, while Sir Robert is here, we should decide what's the next to be done about the case. The case? Sir Robert... I'm afraid I don't think much purpose will be served by going on with the case now. What? 
Of course we must go on. I have made many sacrifices for this case. Some of them I had no right to make, but I made them just the same. But there is a limit and I've reached it. I'm sorry, Sir Robert. More sorry, perhaps, than you are. But the Winslow case is now closed. Balderdash! My father doesn't mean what he says, Sir Robert. Kate! Give me back that letter. This letter, Sir Robert, is from a Colonel Watherstone. The father of the man I'm engaged to. He says our efforts to discredit the Admiralty in the House of Commons today have made the name of Winslow a nationwide laughingstock. That unless we drop this whining and reckless agitation, I suppose he means the case, he will exert every bit of influence he has over his son to prevent him marrying. Excuse me a moment. Hello? Yes, one moment, please. It's for you, Sir Robert. Oh, thank you. Hello? Oh, yes, Michael. If he... I, I didn't know he was going to speak. I see. Well, go on. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Indeed. I follow you. Thank you, Michael. Good night. There's been a most interesting development in the house since I walked out. Oh, what? My secretary tells me that a barrister friend of mine, who, quite unknown to me, was interested in the case, got on his feet shortly before 9.30 and delivered one of the most scathing denunciations of a government department ever heard in the house. Yes? The debate revived, of course, and the First Lord, who must have felt himself fairly safe, certainly found himself under attack from all parts of the house. It appears that rather than risk a division, he has at this moment given an undertaking that he'll instruct the Attorney General to endorse our petition of right. The case of Winslow versus Rex can now, therefore, come to court. Well, sir, what are my instructions? The decision is no longer mine, sir. You must ask my daughter. What are my instructions, Miss Winslow? Do you need instructions, Sir Robert? Aren't they already on the petition? Doesn't it say, let right be done? Well then, we must endeavour to see that it is. <laughs> I didn't know you'd arrived from Reading yet. Hello, Mother. Well, I had to be here to hear the verdict. Where's Kate? At the trial. She takes the morning session, then comes home to nurse your father while I go to the court in the afternoon. You never saw such crowds in all your life. Cheers and applause and people being turned out. And Sir Robert and the Attorney General going at each other hammer and tongs. How did Ronnie get on in the witness box? Two whole days he was cross-examined. Imagine the poor little pet. Kate says he made a very good impression with the jury. How is Kate? You heard about John breaking off the engagement. And that's what I meant. How's she taken it? You can never tell with Kate. She never lets you know what she's feeling. Ah, oh, Dickie. You're back. Father. I didn't know you were in a wheelchair. Oh, I've been forced to adopt this ludicrous form of propulsion. I had a letter from Mr. Lamb at the bank at Reading. He says you've joined the Territorials. Well, from all accounts, there's a fair chance of a scrap quite soon, and if there is, I don't want it to be all over before I can get into it. Oh, Dickie. You're a good lad, Dickie. All right. I say I'm starving. Uh, Violet will be back to serve lunch quite soon. Violet? She was under sentence last time I was at home. She's been under sentence for the last six months, only she doesn't know it. Neither your father nor I have the courage to tell her. Mm, well, I have the courage to tell her. It's funny you don't then, dear. Well, I will as soon as she comes in. But at the moment, I'm going out to sit in the sun in the garden. He looks awfully sick. The doctors insist he goes to a nursing home when the trial's over. Do you think he will? How do I know? He'll probably find some new excuse. But surely if he doesn't get a verdict this time, he's lost for good? So they say, Dickie. I can only hope it's true. Poor old mother. You've had a rotten time of it. I've said my say, Dickie. He knows what I think. Not that he cares. He never has all his life. Anyway, I've given up worrying. He's always said he knew what he was doing. 
It's my job to pick up the pieces, I suppose. Lord, the heat in that court. Hello, Dicky. Come to be in at the death? Is that what it's going to be? Looks like it. Sir Robert's very worried. He said the Attorney General's speech made a great impression on the jury. Is that you, Kate? Oh, you're so late. How did it go this morning, eh? Sir Robert finished his cross-examination of the postmistress. She admitted she couldn't identify Ronnie in the commander's office, ah. that she couldn't be sure what time he came in, that she'd been called to the telephone while he was buying his postal order, and that all cadets looked alike to her in their uniforms, so it might easily have been another cadet who cashed the five-shilling order. Oh, it was brilliant. He just coaxed her into tying herself in knots. Good, good. But when he'd finished, the Attorney General asked her again whether she was absolutely positive that the same boy who bought the 15 and sixpenny postal order also cashed the five-shilling one. She said she was quite sure because Ronnie was such a good-looking little boy that she'd specially noticed him. I believe it undid the whole of that magnificent cross-examination. Ronnie? Good-looking? Rot. She must be lying. Nonsense, Dickie. He looked so nice in the box yesterday, didn't he, Kate? Yes, Mother. You're going to be very late for the resumption. Oh, dear. Arthur, you'll eat up all your lunch, won't you? I wonder if Violet will remember to pick up those onions. Perhaps I'd better do it on the way back from the court. Come along, Dickie, and when you get to the door, put your head down, like me, and just charge through the crowd and the reporters. Righto, Mother. Come along. I always shout, I'm the maid and I don't know nothing. So don't be surprised. <laughs> Kate, tell me honestly, what does Sir Robert think of our chances now? He seems very worried. Yes. The papers say he told the judge this morning he felt ill and might have to ask for an adjournment. Another of those tricks of his. It got him sympathy and... and possibly an excuse if he's beaten. May I come in? Hmm? Desmond, come in. Thought you were in court. My partner's holding the fort. I wonder if I might see Catherine alone, sir. I have a matter of some urgency to communicate to her. Hmm? Hmm, I see. I'll go back to the garden. Is anything wrong, Desmond? It suddenly occurred to me during the lunch recess that I might see you today. Why? I have a question to put to you, Kate, which, if I had postponed putting it until after the verdict, you might have thought it prompted by pity if we had lost. Do you follow me, Kate? Yes, Desmond, I, I think I do. Then you have some inkling what the question is? Yes, Desmond. I'm sorry, I should have told you that I have no inkling whatever. No, 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 your directness and honesty are two of the qualities I so much admire in you. Will you give me a few days to think it over? But of course, Kate. I know your feeling towards me have never amounted to more than a sort of, well, sh sh shall we say friendliness? A warm friendliness, I hope. That's true, isn't it? Yes, Desmond. You don't love me and never can. I love you. Always have, and always will. It is a situation which I am fully prepared to accept, no matter what you feel or don't feel for me, no matter what you feel for someone else. I want you to be my wife. Thank you, Desmond. <clears throat> May I expect your answer in a few days? Yes. Thank you. Well, it's late and I must get back to court. A brilliant cross-examination this morning, wasn't it? Brilliant. He's a strange man, Sir Robert. Time so cold and distant, yet he has a real passion about this case. I happen to know, and of course this must go no further, but I, I happen to know he made a very great personal sacrifice in order to bring it into court. Sacrifice? What of another brief? Oh, no, 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 something far more than that. Something quite startling. The appointment of Lord Chief Justice. Lord Chief Justice? He turned it down simply to be able to carry on with the case of Winslow versus Rex. Strange are the ways of men, are they not? Uh, goodbye, my dear. Goodbye, Desmond. Lord Chief Justice. Oh, I've been a fool. Desmond gone? May I come in now? Yes, Father. Oh, what did Desmond want? To marry me. I said I'd think it over. Think it over by all means, but decide against it. The choice is quite simple. Either I marry Desmond and settle down to a quite comfortable and not really useless existence, 
Or I go on working for the rest of my life in the Women's Suffrage Association, earning two pounds a week in the service of a hopeless cause. A hopeless cause? Never heard you say that before. I've never felt it before. Suddenly this... And today I heard that John was married last week. Oh, poor Kate. Oh, I've messed up your life, haven't I? I'm so sorry, Kate. So sorry. Don't be, Father. We both knew what we were doing. We were right to do it. Were we? Or was it just brute stubbornness, a refusal to admit defeat? Sir! Oh, sir! Oh, Violet back from the court. What happened? Oh, Miss Kate, what a shame you missed it. Just after they came back from lunch and Mrs. Winslow, she wasn't there, nor Master Ronnie. The cheering and the shouting and the carrying on, you never heard anything like it. And Sir Robert standing there with his wig on crooked and tears running down his face. Running down his face they were, and not able to speak because of the noise. <laughs> could me did a bit of crying too. He just couldn't help it. Oh, it was lovely. And then Cook had her hat napped off by the man behind, cheering and waving his arms about something chronic and shouting about liberty. Uh, and, and outside in the street was just the same. Some of them shouting, good old Winslow, and singing, but he's a jolly good fellow. Uh, and Cook had her hat knocked off again. Oh, it was lovely. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, Mrs. Winslow asked me most particular to pick up some onions, but I... That's I all right, Violet. I think she'll pick them up herself. Perhaps you'd make us some tea? Oh, of course. Uh, I expect you can both do with a cup now that it's all over. Uh, congratulations, sir, I'm sure. Thank you, Violet. It would appear then that we've won. Yes, father. It would appear that we've won. I would have liked to have been there. Sir Robert Morton. Oh, sir Robert. Good afternoon. I thought you might like to hear the actual terms of the Attorney General's statement, so I jotted it down for you. Here it is. I say now, on behalf of the Admiralty, that I accept the declaration of Ronald Arthur Winslow, that he did not write his name on the postal order, that he did not take it, and that he did not cash it, and that consequently he was innocent of the charge brought against him two years ago. I make that statement without any reservation, intending it to be a complete acceptance of the boy's statements. Now, Mr. Winslow, in the question of damages and costs no, to you... No, please. No more trouble. This... This paper is all I have ever asked for. Oh, sir, the, the papers are at the door and the gentlemen say, will you please make a statement? Very well, Violet. Tell them I'm coming. Yes, sir. Well, what shall I say, Kate? You'll think of something. Yes, I could say, this victory is not mine. It is the people who have triumphed as they always will triumph over despotism. Well, how does that strike you, son? A trifle pretentious, perhaps? I should say it, nonetheless. It will be very popular. Yeah, perhaps I'd better say simply what I feel. Thank God we beat him. Sir Robert, this is probably the last time I shall see you, and I must say something. I have entirely misjudged your attitude in this case. And if, in doing so, I've ever seemed rude or ungrateful, I am sincerely and humbly sorry. My dear Miss Winslow, you've never seemed so. And my attitude in this case has been the same as yours. A determination to win at all costs. Only when you talk of gratitude, you must remember those costs were not mine, but yours. Haven't you, too, made a certain sacrifice for the case? The robes of that office would not have suited me. If you chance to endow an unimportant incident with a romantic significance, you're perfectly at liberty to do so. Now I must go. Why are you always at such pains to prevent people knowing the truth about you? Why be ashamed of your emotions? Because I distrust them. To fight a case on emotional grounds is the surest way to lose it. Cold, clear logic should be a lawyer's only equipment. Was it cold, clear logic that made you weep today at the verdict? I wept today because right had been done. Not justice? No, not justice. Right. It's easy to do justice. Very hard to do right. Unfortunately, while the appeal of justice is intellectual, the appeal of right appears for some odd reason to induce tears in court. Now, may I leave the witness box? You'd make a very good advocate. 
Why don't you direct your feministic impulses towards the law courts, Miss Winslow, and abandon the lost cause of women's suffrage? Because I don't believe it is a lost cause. A pity. In the House of Commons in days to come, I shall make a point of looking up at the gallery in the hope of catching a glimpse of you in that... Uh, Provocative hat. I say, Sir Robert. Ronnie. I'm awfully sorry, sir. I didn't know anything was going to happen. Where were you? At the pictures. I say, we won, didn't we? Yes, we won. Goodbye, Miss Winslow. Shall I see you in the house then one day? Yes, Sir Robert, one day. But not in the gallery. Across the floor. Perhaps. Goodbye. <laughs> And so ends The General Murders Are production of The Winslow Boy, written by Terence Rattigan and adapted for radio by Rue Pullen, in which you heard the following players. As Wotherstone, Derek Barnes. Violet, Nellie Lamport. Dickie, Keith Buckley. Desmond Curry, Don Pascoe. Ronnie, Ray Hartley. Grace, Winifred Green. Catherine, Diana Perryman. As Sir Robert Morton, Leonard Bullen. And as Arthur Winslow, you heard our star, Robert Stewart. The General Motors Hour is directed by Harry Harper, who produced tonight's play. Until then, this is John Deese saying good night to you all from the General Motors Hour, which now signs off from the Macquarie Network and cooperating stations throughout Australia.